don't lose that wonder because if you lose that wonder and you lose that um, ability to hope and to you know think of what the possibilities are, you lose the creativity and you could lose the passion and the desire to be able to do beyond just one thing or beyond what you do in your day to day. And I think that's um, the worst thing that could happen to a human being. Cindy Chin is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Cindy is an entrepreneur, venture strategist, and cultural ambassador of the arts and sciences. As CEO of CLC Advisors, she is an advisor and board member to founding startup teams, a subject matter expert in frontier technologies, Opportunity Scout for VC and LP partners, a global strategic thought leader, and a sought after speaker. She recently co founded and became the COO of Clipper, a video analysis and management VAM platform using AI and machine learning to help you users quickly identify key moments within video content enabling them to organize, search, interact, and share with ease and efficiency. She is also a NASA Data Knot, an open data innovation program to promote data science, coding, and gender diversity that operates within the office of the CIO at NASA headquarters. She is a mentor in the Google for Startups Accelerator a visiting professor at FH Salzburg University of Applied Sciences, teaching about deep data in deep space and a RSA, Royal Society for Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce Fellow. She was a co-founder of Women on the Block, the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Program Curator for the Digital League Conference and Expo in Cologne and a member of the faculty uh, of the Startup Executive Academy of Silicon Castles, also in Salzburg, Austria. In 2018, she was named as one of the Entrepreneur Magazine's 50 Most Daring Entrepreneurs in 2018, along with leaders including SpaceX and Tesla CEO Elon Musk, General Motors CEO, Mary Barra, chief celebrity chef and founder of the World Central Kitchen, Jose Andres, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, author Kevin Kwan, Chance the Rapper, Academy Awards winning actress and founder of Hello Sunshines, Reese Witherspoon and IBM CEO, Jeannie Rometty. Just for my listeners, I want them to know we know each other through MLove, through a mutual friend of ours, Harold Neidhart, and then later Tinternet and many, many other events and, and um, have not had as many opportunities as we like to, to uh, see each other in person, but enough to make it good and, and build some lasting memories. Um, when I very first heard you speak, it was in the Hamburg Hafen at the Future City Campus at Harold's, and, and it was in one of the containers, and you were uh, speaking about data nautics and a lot of your work on space and NASA and, and, and uh, your ties and, and the bigger picture of things. And what really struck a chord, one, you're originally a, a concert pianist or a musician, so gifted in the arts and talents of of, of piano and music, um, but the most eloquent speaker who empowers women and girls and people about data and the future of humanity, where we're going on. And, and so I was starstruck and, and snuck up to you after you got done speaking and said, hey, can I have some NASA stickers? Can, and you, you gladly gave me some. But uh, I, I'm excited to get into some deep dives with you today and, and hope you remember that time. Can you tell me a little bit, because of all this um, experience you've had, what you've talked about, you're talking about 
space, which is future. You're talking about data, emerging technologies in the future. Has any of that prepared you for the craziness that we've gone through these past 12 months? You know, uh, Black Lives Matters, COVID, uh, Belarus, the inauguration, you know, all the other crazy, enormous things that have been going on in the world. Have you been prepared or were you also taken into the funnel of darkness uh, with things? Well, Mark, um, thanks so much for bringing us back to memory lane. That was a very special moment. And I have to thank Harold for asking me to come and talk in Hamburg at Unlove and, and give that keynote. I, I remember being um, so kind of wonderstruck myself because it was the container full of people that I'd never met before. And, uh, you know, you, you never get used to it. And, and thank you for being there as well. And I do remember you came up for the stickers too. We, we talked for a while. Um, it was a very special memory. It was very cold that day, but it was a very special memory. And um, I was speaking about Mars and how important it was to think a little further ahead and into the future and not so stuck in the way that things are currently being done now. And I, you know, everybody in Europe is talking about moonshots. We're far beyond that now. We're about to land our second rover in on Mars in eight days time. So, you know, we need to think a little more forward and be more brave and be more daring and be more courageous in order to do that. As far as what's prepared um, for what has happened in the last year, uh, I was prepared. Like you, I traveled a lot extensively and my work took us remotely. And so we would be used to being on a digital screen and conducting working calls. And it was because of NASA that I learned of Zoom uh, and was using that with the Data Knots program there. That's how we prim primarily communicated and met with NASA scientists or subject matter experts from companies like NVIDIA um, or other locations at NASA Ames. <clears throat> and we would talk about data and some of the projects that NASA has available. So it, I was already prepared and quite frankly, kind of happy to have a little bit of home time because it does, you do get very tired, um, burnout. I, I learned something about this pandemic time is that I'm not very good at time math anymore. <laughs> it's just the calculations um, between the US and Europe or US and Singapore, it, it, multiple time zones, the time math just, I can't do it anymore. I, I need to have the five clocks on the wall or the five clocks or whatever it is on your screen. So I know what time it is because otherwise we're jumping all over the place now with all these wonderful video conferencing technologies. So. Yeah, but here we are in, in uh, still in a pandemic and in some places a lockdown. And I have to say, I'm quite used to it. <laughs> now, be, besides the, the digital transformation or preparedness, were you, you, uh, you weren't at Costco buying all the toilet paper and water up, were you? Or were you prepared in, in other physical realms or well, ways as well uh, besides <laughs> well, the digital realm? It is quite kind of scary because I, I live in New York City and New York City was the first place to kind of get the large, large numbers uh, aside from in China or especially at Wuhan. Um, it's, it was kind of scary to see empty shelves down there. I don't have a Costco membership, but my mother does and she readily provides for any of those things um, safely <laughs> should I need it. And yes, I do have a stack here just in case. That's great. Uh, yeah, but uh, but that, that's another thing too. I, I mean, you, you advocate and I talk about climate change and um, sustainability as well. It, it's just like you think about the inventions from history and how intelligent the Italians were to invent of the day and how perfect it was for this kind of time frame. So, um, you know, we can talk about, you know, that as well, but uh, yeah, the, it does, it did spur some certain behaviors. And for me, it was more about having food because I didn't want to go food shopping too much in, in a really large metro metropolitan city and where it's really crowded. So I kind of stocked up in the freezer and and made sure I had flour so I can participate in the yeast and bread baking like a, a lot of our friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a lot more homemade meals, that, that, that's for sure. 
There, um, we're going to go deep right away. I'm, I just can't hold off on it because okay. it's so important. So you and I are both Carl Sagan fans, and and uh, I had his his daughter Sasa Sagan on the show as well when, when her new book came out. But Carl Sagan um, has said many wonderful things, and one of them is, "We are all star stuff." where the basic elements of life and, and those are made up in the elements of our body are made in the interiors of collapsing stars and we are all star stuff and all star dust and uh you you've heard me uh probably say this before but it ties us intrinsically deeply to our earth and and what's going on here on this planet as well as to the bacteria and other microorganisms on, on our world. And I say, first of all, really, what we need is to connect ourselves to our home, to our planet, to realize that we're an integral part of this eco, a bigger ecosystem on spaceship Earth, um, which, is, which is fabulous. But, but then Carl Sagan goes on a little bit further, and he says, there's this, this growing idea that um, of consciousness of awareness that the earth is seen as a single organism and a, and a single organism divided amongst itself is doomed um, and and really that is so true of what we're seeing uh, during this pandemic where we're pointing fingers to other places for the pandemic and we're uh, divided on po political beliefs and the civilization framework just doesn't seem to quite be working for us. Um, how do you feel about those things that Carl Sagan said, although he was always in outer space, he was always thinking, but his deep love for our planet and, and where we're at, do you have some things you can try and relate to that at all? Um, absolutely. I think Sagan was a, a wonderful educator and so eloquent in how he presented his perspectives. And I loved his work and I still love it. Um, and, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, the span of things and how we do so much, right? And of, and you know where you and I talk about the future all the time, but when you look at it from the context of science and time, I'm gonna I'm gonna geek out because you want to go deep. If you look at it from the span of science and time, time is not a linear path. Time is curved. You know, there, there's much better scientists and physicists out there who can explain it than I can. It's not a linear path. It's curved, and there are times when, when pun intended. Um, there are moments when the time gets warped or you see fissures in there and we're looking into space for that science, right? And for the mathematics that proves those theories, some of, the, some of which have been proven. And in terms of how we are as human beings in, an organ, in a single organism going around in Earth in that analogy, we're also molecules made out of different things, right? One of the most in kind of um, posts that really moved me of late in the last week or so was this picture of the Big Bang, right? It's, a, it's not a real photograph because we didn't have cameras back then, but it is kind of a, an illustration of it. And it goes to say our solar system was once a swirling disk of gas and dust, right? The weird thing is that 4.6 billion years ago, um, and now that's still the case and it's still here, except for we're just organized in human beings, chairs, glasses, coffee cups, plants, um, you know, all this other stuff that we've created. So everything you have is from that and everything that is for tomorrow, right? So you Absolutely. talk about the way our our ideologies, right, and politics occur. We're molecules, we're constantly moving, we're constantly in flux and we're constantly bouncing off to each other. And there'll be collisions and there'll be fissures and yet there's also some sort of symmetry too. So does it make sense from a scientific perspective that we think our politics are divided? Of course, 
if you think of it from a scientific pattern, that is going to happen. You always have positive and negative fields out there um, that's proven. It's, it's not something that Cindy has said. It's really something people have proven it in physics and won Nobel Prizes for it. But they will have positive and negatives and you will have opposing opinions because we're just a collection of all this star stuff, as you want to call it, or all this dust coming together and trying to find a form in order to settle. So from a scientific perspective, you look at it that way. And more Sagan-like, and you look at it from the, you know, 200,000 mile <laughs> or plus, right, perspective, yes. From here, down in planet Earth, in our own little containers that we have that we called our minds, it's a little harder to kind of see that, so. He, he also said something else that was, uh, well, he said, I mean, all his books, Cosmos, the series, and, and, and the other things, yeah. but he said, you know, um, human beings, we are a way for the cosmos, the universe to know itself. And uh, I find it so, so true as someone who, uh, you know, it's no secret, I'm a, a, a environmentalist, climate, big on climate action. But my whole journey has been as a futurist as yours, because I, I need to look at that future. And I need to understand the futures that we're going towards and, and the plans of, of what's coming up because it truly helps me um, to understand what we're experiencing now and what we need to change or do to, to reach those positive futures. And, um, you know, a lot of people are really almost bitchy and moany about uh, the space, going to Mars, going to the moon. So, it's, you know, we need to fix our planet. In some respects, I agree, but no, uh, the only reason we know about any of our environmental problems, about the, the, the pulse, the lifeblood, the heartbeat of our Earth, is because we took that moonshot, because we went to outer space with emerging technologies, with innovations. But it's not just emerging technologies and innovations. What it is, it's foresight and visions of the future. That is a time clock that is warped because you're already planning you know, for, for, for Mars, maybe six months, or you're planning months ahead of what needs to do when, when that launch occurs and what the trajectories and the math and the path is uh, to get there. And if we had not had those technologies and to look back at our Earth, we, we wouldn't have, you know, the, the, the pale blue dot, we wouldn't have um, Earthrise and, and the, the blue marble and many of those wonderful things that change our view and gave us this overview effect or, or perspective. And so the future pays a big role in both of our, 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 our lives, our work and what we do. And you're also working as CEO as a, you know, the future of using AI and, and, and things of, of media and, and videos, which is, is absolutely fabulous. Um, this year, this past or this 2020 to, to now, as you just said, what, six more days until the next uh, mission to Mars. But those are all, not predictions, pretty accurate of what's coming in the future and plans and, and, and things. But boy, it, what don't you think it was absolutely amazing what we experienced in 2020, Elon Musk and Blue Origin and, uh, and Jeff Bezos and all the launches and stuff during a pandemic where everybody's in lockdown. It was a historical time. Indeed, it was a historical time. You know, when the conversation about should we do this should or should we go um, focus on our planet or should we go to space? I think, you know, I have to challenge that and just say, why can't we do both? Right, why can't we do both? What is keeping us? Is it money? Is it resources? Is it talent? I don't think so. We've proven as a species that we're quite intelligent and we're quite able to create economies and to create markets and, and cities and, and initiatives, et cetera. We can organize and you, you know, human beings are really good at organizing. We're also good at disorder and chaos as well, but we're really good at that. So why can't we do both? Who says that we can't? So I have to challenge that thinking. And you're right, I do agree with you. It's more than just the discovery of pale blue, you know, the pale blue dot and the earth rise. Those are very aspirational and beautiful and certainly um, much needed to be reflected upon. 
but it's also advancements in, in healthcare. It's advancements in materials that we're wearing. It's advancement in, you know, how we're using our devices as well, you know, and, and what's coming in the future. And as far as, yes, it is, you know, it is an extraordinary time in 2020 for these rocket launches and, and you know, new technologies and new spacecraft in order to get astronauts to the space station, et cetera. But if you look back and rewind even a few years ago, that was also not, it was not planned. It's not, you can't, the outcome is not planned, right? The predict, it was a prediction. It was still a lot of risk. It was still unknown. You know, it's still unknown too in eight days time when Perseverance lands on Mars. But think of all the years they carried that emotion in itself, but they persisted nevertheless. They kept going, right? The scientists kept going. And I think that that's probably something that's worthwhile to mention to people when they go into that is, you know, you talk, we talk about the future, but at the same time, people like Sagan, people like, you know, the post that I saw really tells us that this particular moment in time right now present that I'm speaking to you over a digital screen is quite wondrous as well. And don't lose that wonder because if you lose that wonder and you lose that um, ability to hope and to you know think of what the possibilities are, you lose the creativity and you could lose the passion and the desire to be able to do beyond just one thing or beyond what you do in your day to day. And I think that's um, the worst thing that could happen to a human being. Uh, so be, before we move on to another topic be, besides Mars, was the was it called the Inceptor? In was the last Mar, Mars probe that landed? It was Insight. Actually. Insight, Insight. I know yeah. it was uh, in something, Insight, yeah. and and it got there, and it, it drilled down, did the probe, uh, was successful, and then did it did it? That was it. That was. That was kind of a dead, or did it did it continue to function for a little while after that? Oh, oh yeah, those things function. Um, okay. I, I'm not. I I haven't actually tapped in in fact and looked back at the research from Insight, but it's it's still functioning. I believe it's still on Mars. I, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> we it's still there. Out, yeah. We haven't figured out the ret retrieval process, and I don't think it was intended to be re retrieved. Right? If if yeah. there's. Uh, talk of, of science you know they're they're looking for life or what was life on on mars water, and uh, water you know signs of life actually not yeah. life but signs of life um there's also discussions on ethics as well as we don't want to contaminate the planet because we, we, you know human beings were quite um imperfect and we're we're also like you know we are the pathogens now right if we if we go into another planet it's just like we carry bacteria we carry all the all these other, other things we're quite dirty <laughs> in, a in a in a space lab if you want to talk it in a lab sense yeah. uh we're, we're not you know sterile in that sense where, where it's like uh things can be contained so you know there's all these wonderful discussions that are occurring and, and you can jump in on them quite yeah, that, that's for sure. I mean, the the reason I bring in, bring up Insight is because on the way, I mean, I watched the, I, I kind of lost track after it landed and, and did the probe. But on the way, there were several, I mean, it was something like a six month journey, or yeah. quite a few month journey. And then in the process, there were a few adjustment moments where they had to fire and adjust the, the trajectory. And then right before landing again, address the trajectory for the landing and so it's it, it's basically planning well out into the future the path the course it's a lot of it's a lot yeah. of foresight yeah a lot, a lot of math, math. A, lot a lot of math, of math. <laughs> and, and so yeah I, I, a lot of people kind of think it's magic it's hocus pocus and there's a lot involved in, in that whole aspect that i just really like but this is where i want to ask you explain a day, data knot to us and and what you what you do what you did how how that fits into the bigger picture and how, how moving forward what what are you doing what are you working on um in terms of you talked about foresight and insight right in terms of that kind of framework the insight that i had at the time when the data knots program rolled out it was um because my daughter 
was learning how to code in school, in elementary school at the time. And um, as in 2016 at the State of Women Summit <clears throat> at the White House actually, um, Michelle Obama rolled out this summit about women's goals and women's initiatives and kind of a scorecard of how the world was doing, right? And NASA rolled out this program called the Data Knots. They had noticed that the hackathon that they have every year called Space Apps, it's an international hackathon. It gets over 250,000 participants around the world. It's the largest hackathon on the planet actually. And they solve for challenges like sustainability, you know, material science, you know, what are the next things that we need for astronaut suits? Um, they even had a COVID-19 challenge last year, which I was participating in as an ambassador for the program as well. And they noticed that primarily the people who entered those challenges and competitions were really 85% men, right? Or boys. And so they realized you can't live and operate, it, it never was an agency, any of the space agencies are, um, you know, you need all sort of diverse sets of thinking, life, people, et cetera, right, experiences. <clears throat> and so they created this program in order to promote data science. There's over 32,000 open data source sets there. ESA has a ton of data as well um, through their uh, portals that are available to people to use and kind of, kind of play with and come up with solutions or ideas and innovations on that. You know, I was just researching that the other day too um, for a talk and um, it, it's what that program is. And so they, in the first cohort was in the spring of 2016. I think there was only about 20, 25 women on that. And then the second, which was I, where I came in was 50. And ever since then, there's over 250 data knots around the world now. And we do, you know, projects or we have discussions kind of like these webinars with um, NASA scientists. We have them with, um, you know, ch the chief knowledge officer at J. Johnson Space Center, David Meza. He's now at headquarters. He's a senior sci data scientist now at NASA. His role has changed um, as well as um, from time to time an astronaut at different site centers and then subject matter experts. So it's really to teach people about data science. There's a lot of days already data scientists there too that can really get in technically into the data and create things, but it really does take teams in order to put things together and, and to move them forward. And one of the projects that I wanted to work on and started writing a paper about was a simulation uh, with the data tools that we have now on the Friendship 7 mission, which John Glenn uh, did his um, you know, time up in, in space. And it was documented in um, pre-Apollo pre, pre 11 and the Gemini missions. Um, it was documented in the um, Hidden Figures movie, right? And I thought, oh, you know, now we're many years, many decades forward, let's solve it using data tools and what would that look like? And then I wanted to do a Mars One projection, you know, with the team, but we haven't gotten to that. Um, but so that's what the Data Knots does. Um, we go around, some are, you know, incredible people. In fact, I wanna give her a plug, if it's okay. It's like Fig O'Reilly is a Data Knot, but she also worked in Data too, and she's been a wonderful STEM ambassador and spokesperson. She was, was just finished her reign as the Miss Universe Ireland as well. Uh, and now is uh, on CBS Unstoppable. So like, you know, she's a public figure out there really amplifying her spotlight. I'm doing it from a tech standpoint and business standpoint. And then you have people um, like Karen Lopez, who's a, a Microsoft, you know, guru and it comes to data and, and, and an ambassador for that um, in her work, right? So, you know, we're all over the place um, in, in, um, in TJ Rich, who's, a, who's also in, at the BBC and she, does amazing things with sound, right? And data and, and, and all that stuff. So um, the program's out there, it's men and women now, which is great. Um, and um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to get people engaged. You, you had during the uh, 2020 and during the pandemic time, you had a lot of watch parties, launch party watches and, uh, and things. And uh, I, I I was watching as well in a bated breath. And it, it, it's amazing how uh, 
futurists, innovators, those uh, entrepreneurs out there who are really uh, in this new space race and thinking about the future and the new uh, sustainable transitions, what, you know, what renewables, what energies, what built materials we need. Um, the, the, the things that they're doing in that, even though a lockdown comes, even though these shutdowns come, the timelines, the, the, the things keep happening because it's not futuristic, it's innovative, it has social distancing, space distancing, it's, it's their clean environments, their different operating systems so that they can, they're automated, they're mechanized, that those things can keep functioning, but there are also bigger projections on the progress of human intelligence and, and, and innovations that some of those tools that even though they're using them to get to, to Mars or to outer space and things, that they're very much applicable to things that we could use here on this earth because it proves and it test, stands the test of that resilience test uh, and, and the harsh conditions of outer space. Um, what would you say was your biggest moments of joy or, or some things, or did you have multiple ones during, during this time uh, with what transpired? And tell us why you were so excited about it. So again, in the framework that you presented of foresight and insight, one of the insights that I had was, you know, I said we were traveling too much and we, you and me, because we're I'll collectively say that I know you traveled a lot more, but I was glad to be at home and simply I just wanted to sit still and, and, and do my yoga classes and meditation, which really keeps me grounded and really present in this moment. So that's insight so that I can go out and, and later on and do other things. And that insight for me was very helpful because then I did get to connect on that level. And, you know, I have a bunch of plants here that I had gotten prior to the pandemic and they're, these plants are natural air filters. You can get them at your grocery store or at Trader Joe's, right? Um, and people don't realize that they do filter out things like formaldehyde and carbon dioxide and stuff like that. And they're in part of nature, right? So connecting with nature on that level and being wondrous. And it really became like my own little lab. It's my own space station. And that's what I had said in, in you know, even on social media, I was like, this is your chance. If you ever wanted to go to outer space, your psychology is incredibly important. Your mental health is because it's an isolated closed environment, right? You, you don't, you're not going outside. You're not going food shopping. You're not going to the yoga studio. You're not going, you know, to the store and window shopping or, or the coffee shop or anything like that, you're really at home in the closed environment with the minimal amount of things that you have because you can't carry too much. Weight is a problem, right? Um, when you go on these rocket launches. Um, so that really kind of acknowledgement really is helpful. And I think, it, you know, there's a lot of people who are struggling out there right now and they're not alone, right? We have our moments as well. Um, and it, it, it concerned me. And so, you know, I decided to host the Zoom calls with the kind of our internet friends daily because I knew that that isolation can be a problem for a lot of people, especially who are very extroverted and used to jumping all over the place on a plane and whatnot. And so I wanted it to be a landing page for them to feel like they're home, so to speak, right? Um, so that uh, was another acknowledgement on that. And lastly, you know, speaking of which, I think people are so afraid about the outcomes and, and there's a lot of um, unfortunate decisions that occurred, especially in the US. Um, you know, I really feel it very personally because I saw, you know, I heard and I saw, I was living in a city when, you know, 20,000, 22,000 people passed away, right? And that's in itself is like two thirds of a town sometimes in the middle of some European country or even in a village somewhere, right? So that kind of perspective in really understanding that you're a part of an ecosystem and not just the world revolves around you um, really changes your framework, right? I've already lived that way already. That's just who I am. But I think it, it really hit home to a lot of folks. But um, one thing I want to say to people in, who kind of, you know, they told me this is the best thing they've heard this entire year is that we are going to have some of the most extraordinary astronauts 
from this time period. And it's because of all the kids who are doing remote learning out there. And I wanna give a shout out to them and their parents who've had to raise them at home. It's not easy to have a screaming child and whatnot, but you're gonna have one of the most extraordinary astronauts out there because they're going to know what these closed isolated environments are like. They're going to keep themselves occupied. They're going to know that it they'll come out of it, right? So, and they're gonna know like there's something on the other side waiting for them, you know, to be on that other shore as Sagan calls it, right? So, um, so keep that in mind and, and I hope that helps people out there when you think about it. I definitely know that that will help people and, and that's beautiful. It's also nice to, you know, um, wh whether, the, the, you know, not only this is our, these homes have become our human zoos during the lockdown, but as you so nicely said it, they're kind of our new test of our own, our own spaceship. Is it, uh, is it designed in such a way that it's uh, healthy for us, that we can survive for a little w a bit in this right. confined space and come clear with our thoughts? There's a good, uh, friend of mine, his name's Alexander Maria Fassbender, and he's actually a space coach. He, um, he trains uh, uh, people in the psychological aspects of being an astronaut and going out to outer space. Can you handle confined spaces? Can you handle being alone? Can you handle all the, the things of that? And mainly the mental and psychological aspects uh, of having to figure out what you're going to do with yourself. Are you going to re do with your time to be efficient and not crawl up in a ball and go into a coma or depression um, with the time? And so a lot of that was a big struggle for a lot of people, especially when we were seeing the things like Black Lives Matter. We're seeing the things like the inauguration. We're seeing the things with Belarus and, and other craziness going on in the world. And we're like, well, you know, what's going on in our world so we really have we're like it's a fear that comes over um i don't know if you have any more to say to that but it really it, it it i've said it many times it's such a horrible thing that we've gone through and it's been a wake-up call it's shown the microscope on all our problems and, and the problems have bubbled to the surface so now we definitely know how to fix them and we should move forward to fix them but on the flip side, not only has it been better for you and I, some fabulous things really happened for you during this time. CEO of, uh, of Clipper and you started this something new and, uh, and, and other things. So I, I would like you to go into both of those if you if you have, have some more sure. on Sure. So three things. One, to, to close our conversation on, on our, our little um, environments, right, is we also learned things like we don't need to consume as much, less consumption. And, and what do we need? Toilet paper, you know, do we need as much toilet paper? No, the solve is, is a bidet if you have one available to you, right? Or you use less because there's not as much. So less consumption. <clears throat> that also tells us that we have more resources than, than we need, right? And can those resources also be divided across to people who really do need them as well? And that kind of thinking, um, the empathy and the compassion out there is really necessary in an environment where there's uh, chaos and disorder and those movements, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. There's a lot of people out there who are afraid they may not have a home, they may not have food on their table. And so I think of them and I try to support, especially artists too, who are out there struggling. I try to support them uh, if I can. And, um, you know, whatever the circumstances are, I think we just need to hear more about those um, so that we can, people who have the means can help them, right? Um, second, whenever there's any advancements in, in science, especially in space travel, there's always been some sort of, uh, civil disorder, right? You think about the last, the last time we went to the moon, um, we had the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, you saw reflections of that. Now, because of technology and social media, you're going to see a greater ripple effect or a greater, you know, interpretation of that because the access to information is so much easier and at fingertips, right? It's literally in our, our cell phones. Um, and so, that's not surprising because they're seeing what's happening. They're asking these questions that we 
kind of talked about this today on why is it important to do this? We are struggling here. We don't have these rights. And they're seeing certain countries do have them and they want that. People want that. I mean, think about this new social media app that you and I have discovered and I won't say their name, but you know, it, it, China has closed its doors on them. You know, it's within a few days, but during the few days time, it was written about in the New York Times you know, you have a bunch of Chinese citizens who are on it, who are eager to have these conversations that you and I are having without censor and without um, recourse, right? So um, the dialogue and the discussion is necessary. That's what's been missing in our contained environments. You're going to see an amplification because we're, we're hungry for news. It's like, you know, when you think about the wars in the, in the beginning of the 19th century or so, people were hungry to hear anything on the radio, right? We're hungry to hear anything. So and our radios have become our screens on our laptops and it's become our Twitter feeds and, and whatnot. So we're hungry for knowledge, we're curious. Um, and um, I, I don't know the ways of men as greatly as I'd like to. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a grand task and the people who are out there who are servicing that, you know, are, um, thankful for them to do that. It's hard to be in those kind of leadership positions, but, you know, to be controversial or not, um, I do believe that in order for things to kind of move towards the future, there needs to be a transfer of power to the younger generations. There needs to be a transfer of wealth to more, you know, equitable circumstances so that basic needs are being met, people are being heard. Um, and that may be contrary to um, some of my more conservative friends, but there is an absolute need for that. And that's a much deeper discussion uh, that that could occur it, better, I think, in a round table than just one person off that. But there is those are necessary, I believe. Well, uh, when, when I speak to people at the United Nations or the World Economic Forum about what are the biggest things that we can do to draw down the human suffering problems we have on this earth or environmental problems. Um, you know, most people don't know about Paul Hawkins book, the drawdown, and, and now it's in the drawdown review and we've got some new tools available. Uh, <clears throat> but even the consensus with the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers because there's not like this unified knowledge of what it is, but there, the, the real unified knowledge, just to break it down very simple, is um, a global food reform. It's the basic needs of, of humanity. It's during this pandemic, we've seen that everybody scrambled towards food, but we've also realized our food systems is, was disrupted. You know, no more restaurants, no more um, uh, uh, fresh food and uh, farm disruption, migrant workers, all, all sorts of things in that respect, a huge food waste but that the second and third biggest way to fix human suffering and to draw down our human suffering and environmental problems is to empower women and girls. And I see you as a strong advocate for women and girls and as an example, not only in, in the future of emerging technologies and coding, but also as a voice of how do we get that equality and how, how do we do that? So, I mean, at this point in time for me, is, um, I know it's just us, but could you give us some, some wisdoms of what you do to empower women and girls and, and what your messages are? And, you know, whether it's multiple messages, uh, probably also very indigenous and local to whoever you're speaking to your audiences and, and and what their needs are, but what are some of the messages that you deliver to help uh, women and girls? Um, I've been very fortunate in my entire career and even in my younger years um, as a youth to have had mentorship. I've had people advocate for me, um, complete strangers who don't even look like me, um, open up opportunities. And, and I kind of will see almost every one of their faces in that because those are moments that really um, touched me as a as a person and as a as a impressionable young person too, right? Um, so I I have that I carry that with me, and part of the things is that um, in the last few decades I've spent the time mentoring young women 
and and also men of color, right? Um, in order to help them with their careers, because I realized how important it was for me. And <clears throat> just the knowledge and even the security and knowing that I'm seen and recognized is 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 um at that time, right? It is important for someone else is to be recognized and seen. And if you don't see it, you won't have representation. And that's exactly what you're talking about in terms of the SDG goals and what people talk about at the World Economic Forum. If there's not any representation there, <clears throat> then people can't see that future, right? And you can't just build and do it yourself. Sorry. Um, so that's very important. And I'm just one of many people who are doing out that out there. The second thing is, um, education is incredibly important. You know, I spent time both on the tech side and as well as on the academic side in opening those opportunities up when somebody comes to me and, and say, you know, would you consider this? I really seriously do consider it, even if I've never met them before. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is, you know, uh, Google came over, um, Dan Feld, who's also from Kinternet, um, came over a few years ago and said, would you be interested in doing, we're launching this startup accelerator, would you be interested in being a mentor? I was like, sure, it's no problem. It's kind of what I've been doing before. It's just, you know, now with a fancy name attached to it. And, you know, so I became a that. And because of that, um, this professor, um, Amy Yaboa from Howard University um, came over to me and said, I found you on the database. I'm building an AI data lab at Howard University. Would you help me you know, be my mentor on that. And I said, absolutely, what do you need? Like literally, she didn't even have to explain it. And I was like, yes, absolutely, right? <clears throat> when you talk about what has happened in the current events, you know, what are the things in the data that's not there, right? And I said, this absolutely needs to be done because, you know, society is, is, is saying, it's screaming, it's yelling, it's protesting, it's demonstrating and illustrating that um, this is needed. And so, you know, I, she's, now going to be funded by a major American foundation um, to build this lab at Howard. And, and um, I am very fortunate and you see potential, when you see potential and talent like that and drive, you're, it makes what you do very easy and you're just along for the ride. I am along for the ride because she's an extraordinary and exceptional person and she's an educator as well, right? So, it, you know, she takes off a lot of boxes in my, in my book. Um, and she's going to affect future generations, right, in, in what they do and what they want to learn about data science or they want to participate more because she is that representation. And, and, you know, people, when they hear it, they think of the other university next to a river in New England, right? And I said, no, 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 this is the one in Washington, D.C. It's not, it sounds like it, but it's not that. And, and they immediately go for the prestige. And I was like, no. You need to understand that this public university or this private university is important as just as an equally important. You know, I've been in rooms where there are uh, a bunch of heads of states in there and diplomats and you get tired of telling them who you are, right? And, and my answer is that when I go in those moments, I'll say to them, I'm here as a private citizen. And if anything across the world in the last four years, five years, right? the private citizen's voice is equally in their vote is equally as important as a celebrity or a head of state, right? So those kind of moments are, are quite exceptional. And Howard University is the, the school and alma mater of the vice president of the United States now, Kamala Harris, and um, also um, the uh, respectful and, and rest in peace, you know, Chadwick Boseman, who was Black Panther in Wakanda. So, extraordinary people um, as well. And some people may not have seen or know him. So here you go. That's beautiful. We skipped over a little bit, but that's okay because we're in a circle back. I want to know more about your new position as CEO oh, yeah. of Clipper. I want to know more about Clipper. And uh, also some pretty cool things happened during this uh, crazy time for Clipper. So tell us about that. Yes, Clipper. That we were. That was the third thing that we were going to talk about. But we, you and I, will go down these down these That's paths. Okay. And I love that. I love it. Um, Clipper is. Um, you know, I talked about having those Zoom calls every day, and during those Zoom calls, um, in New York is pretty scary, right? Um, we. I wanted to know what the uh, 
information about what the coronavirus is going to be any public policy you know discussions or any um announcements from the cdc or dr fauci here in the us and then at the same time i really wanted to know what the global economy was like because it's going to affect our work and and uh, our positions right on a on a financial level and whether or not companies would be um salient and be able to survive and so um you know it was a based on a need of needing to be at multiple zoom or webex or teams meetings in these wonderful media companies like bloomberg and axios and politico you know politics was a very big deal back then it still is a very big deal now and all these discussions and you just can't be in the same place at once anymore right because we're all confined to one screen that's what this pandemic has done or one thing at a time and so I wanted to have a library that I could go back to as really the Trinity Library of those video meetings that have been recorded um, and be able to go back to them at a much quieter time when there wasn't a lot, a lot of noise happening and really kind of focus and pay attention on those those moments. Um, and so Clipper, we've, what, what we've done is we are creating um, the AI and the machine learning technology in order to help people with the meetings that they missed, right? And kind of condense that conversation to only the snippets that you really need. You can still view the whole entire meeting, but it really just cuts down to those moments. So um, in the context of our talk today, if you just wanted to hear in the beginning, our discussion about Mars, you know, you could just click on a button and it would just go to that point in Mars. But if you decide you want to come to here at this discussion, we're talking about Clipper, you can do that as well, right? So the entire video is still intact and uh, and that's what we're doing. And uh, it's very super exciting. And we're learning a lot about how people talk and, and be at meetings and really helping save time so they can focus on the moments that matter. I absolutely love it. So uh, you're fortunate enough to let me in on a beta of it and we'll try it out on this call actually. Yeah. But there's some <clears throat> tons of neat functionality, probably more to come where it's not just kind of the, the clips and the chaptering and, and, and getting it into uh, the cliff notes or the highlights, uh, highlight reel, but there's a, a, lot of, a, a, lot of, a lot of other things around that also for live where people can make comments and interact and, and, and do some really nice things with it. So I wish you uh, tons of luck and I'm excited to, to be let in on it and, and, and be part of it and we'll, we'll get inside ideas uploaded and, and uh, hopefully you guys will be able to develop more and we'll be able to improve our long drawn out deep dives. Uh, the, kind, the kind of reason for that, I mean, I guess this is uh, important to, to bring this in is <clears throat> you have decades of experience, knowledge and education and work that's gone in this and to, to break that down into a TED talk into the quick elevator pitch, it just doesn't do it justice um, for, all, for all your years of work of that. And most of the people I have on the show, they've written books, um, thick books, uh, thin books, and you know studied and, and done years of research. And then said, ah, just give me the cliff note version, you know? I, I want people to get, uh, let's remove the bias, let's get into the sense making and let's do a deep dive about um, who you are, why, what's the journey? Because there's a bigger story, uh, a humane story, this humane technology, uh, technological revolution that we've kind of got to get onto out of this uh, bashing and negativity or division that we kind of make technology humane and also work better for us. And so I see so many beautiful things with Clipper that could happen and, and do, and not only in academia, but also in just the media that we disseminate, how we do that more efficiently and, and get the concise views of that. And so uh, on a deep dive, long discussion where Mark talks too long, this Clipper is probably f fabulous, and may maybe not. <laughs> I think it is. Um, first of all, Mark, you're wonderful and you make anybody shine and, and look, even feel more and look more intelligent, <laughs> which is wonderful. And then the second, thank you so much for saying that about Clipper and, uh, and those kind words. Um, I want to make I want to also make sure that other people can have access to it, too. So if they want to have access to it and, and you know, play with it for free, 
we are offering five hours of processing for everybody. You can go to apps.clipper.ai, app.clipper, C-L-I-P-R.ai and sign up for an account and upload a couple of videos to see what we're doing with that. So um, yeah, in a nutshell, I just love to learn and love to read. So that's who I am in a nutshell. And that's what my body of work and professional life has been. So, you know, it's a, it would be, and to quote uh, our mutual friend, Yossi Vardy, right? Who talks about, uh, he's a venture capitalist in, in Israel. Um, to quote him is like, you should be planning for your life to be working to probably your 70s now before it was what, 55, I think, or 59 was the retirement age, 65 in Germany now, we should be planning our work lives to be 70 plus. And when you do that, you realize there's a lot of time, you know, depending on where you are, to do things. And so are you going to be doing something, you know, you're lucky if you're doing something for 60 years, right? Uh, and whatnot. But if you're going to be doing something like what, are, what is it that you want to do? And so take that Take seize seize that opportunity, carpe diem, right? Yeah, and, and seize figure it, out what make that is. it efficient. Yeah, make it exactly. make it worth it. You know, don't don't waste those moments. And that you know that goes back to Carl Sagan and many others. As uh, um, uh, Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson says it so well as, uh, as well. Trillions of trillions of trillions likelihood that we were able to be here on this earth to be born. It's uh, such a wonderful gift and unlikelihood uh, chance that we have and we should make the most of it, you know, and uh, even uh, greats like uh, um, Steve Jobs, you know, live every day like it was your last and, you know, really make the best and most use out of it. And part of that is the tools of the future, the emerging technologies, the data, the to use them effectively instead of e-junk or e-smog or e, you know, e-waste that we really figure out how to get concise and get into the things that we need. And, and uh, it's a different form, not only now knowledge platform, but uh, of this collective intelligence that uh, is combined and gives you a real time update of, of human collective intelligence that gives us that springboard off into these great futures and, and can get us on that exponential path that we need to be to keep up with our exponentially growing world. So, I mean, we could go deeper and deeper like crazy, but I have this hard, hard question. It's the only one I'm going to give you today. Um, and it's the burning question, WTF, but it's not the swear word, although you probably said that maybe once this past 12 months. Uh, it's what's the futures? Poor What's Cindy. the future for me? Yeah. Oh gosh, for me, it's really hard when you're a yoga yogi and you live in the present, right? Um, if you're anxious, you fear the future, right? And if you're stable and whatnot, you know things will work out. So you have to decide which one of those that you're going to be. And I've kind of laid my path. And I've been on this path for 12 years and a path with Clipper now and a path as a mother, a path as a data knot. You know, there's all these different paths and somehow they go kind of in that same direction on, on this ocean that I'm living in. That's, that's my world. And so the future is really to continue this journey and to continue connecting people, to continue um, to talk about these things and really listen, right? My, my future is all about listening right now and, and understanding what is it that people want and people need and then they, those opportunities will come. So I'm at, on the boat where it says, it'll all work out somehow. And, you know, I don't wanna be too naive. You know, those are very big problems that you deal with, with food insecurity and, and climate change. And we can talk offline on, how we, how people can get involved, et cetera. And uh, I'll play my part, do my part, that's it. Pretty well, simple. We'll definitely put in the show notes. So all, all your websites and all your links, uh, the Clipper link that you mentioned, we'll put mm -hmm. in the show description so that people Thank can you. easily get to those. That, that's just a, a, a given. Um, and, and it's so true. I mean, the, not only, <clears throat> 
And at the beginning of our call, we kind of talked how we met and how we know each other. But the last time we saw each other physically, uh, person to person, was at DLD with Yossi Vardy, who you mentioned, and right. uh, many other greats of our, our friends at the DLD conference in, in, uh, in Munich. And we went out to a wonderful dinner and uh, mm -hmm. then later kind of moseyed on down to uh, the World Economic Forum in, mm -hmm. in Davos. <clears throat> And, you know, and then just things went crazy, but we were started out the decade with a decade of action, a bang. I mean, there was so many smiles and, and uh, wonderful things going on uh, and being discussed. And, and I see that that uh, what what's occurred now is there's been a laser focus of what we're doing, we're, we're saying we're not going to waste our time on this unimportant things anymore or not get muddled up, but we've got this focus of where we need to go in the future, but also what are the new operating systems? What are the new models for the future? And so when I ask you that question, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the future or what's the futures, because it's really plural, um, Without those plans, without those goals, without knowing us, we're you know we're the ship without a rudder, we're, we're the, uh, uh, a boat without any direction, or a spaceship without any direction of where we're going. And I, I believe that the people I speak to on the show and you who are doing fabulous things, are people who have a vision of the future. They have that foresight which is a roadmap and a plan. For me, the plan, and we can, you know, we'll talk about it offline, obviously, but it is the sustainable development goals and the Green New Deal and donut economics and, and uh, planetary boundaries, those big plans that are taking us to these resilient, more desirable futures. And I only have really three questions left for you before we end our call today. And there's very selfish questions for my listeners because I want to give them something that empowers them, that uplifts them, that uh, they can say, that's something I can apply to my life. And so if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners uh, as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to truly change their life, what would it be your message? Oh, yes. Um, I have two things. Perfect. There's no better time than the present to start, to get started. There's no better time, right? You're in a lockdown, so you're not going to the bars. I'm sure most of you aren't going to the bars and stuff like that. There's no better time to get started and start figuring out what those plans are for the futures. It's kind of pretty obvious where my future is going to be pointing towards. It's, you know, I, ha I hold a title of NASA data knot that kind of tells you <laughs> one. Uh, and then the second, which I love, and I've said it before in other podcasts, is innovation is where the crazy people have stature. Think about that. I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Joe Campbell. What, yeah, I love Joseph Campbell. I used to run a, a, a Joseph Campbell group. Um, trying to think what what we called it. It was, it was so long ago. It's over 20 years ago, but it just the hero's journey and, and all the follow your bliss. Joseph Campbell is great. But I've got a question for you, and it's really for the young, young innovators uh, that are in your field, looking at, towards space, looking towards data and emerging technologies. Um, those who are even close to the field that you're in, what, what, are things that sh they should be looking for are ways that they can make a real impact? Or would you say, do your focus, or these are ways that you can truly make big impacts in our day and age today? Well, first of all, I, I do have to gently correct you. That was Bill Campbell, not Joseph Campbell. Oh, Bill Campbell. Campbell, not Joseph Bill, Campbell. Okay. Right, Bill, Bill Campbell okay. was the, he's the Silicon Valley expert and coach. He was the coach of the UCLA basketball team and whatnot, and he was extraordinary. Um, so that's Bill Campbell. And then the young innovators is, um, people talk about um, with, with care, I think there's a little bit of controversy sometimes when they talk about passion, right? It, it's like, find something that you're passionate about. And what you mean by passion is not just um, that you, you think about it all the time, 
you put your energy and efforts into it. So it's really a question about energy. It's like, where do you put your attention? That's energy. Where do you use your words? That's energy because you're expending it. You're using it. You're spending energy in order to talk about it. What are you writing about? What are you reading about? That's a level of energy. So, you know, find what it is that that passion is and it will change and that's okay. But when you're excited about it, you can hear it in one person's voice. You can hear it in their face. They're smiling. You can see it, right? So find what that is and then find somebody else who you admire and who you want to talk to. And don't be afraid to reach out to them, right? And, and say, what you said has really moved me. Would you have 15 minutes to talk to me about this? Because I think sometimes that's often intimidating even so for me, you know, there's certain people that I want to talk to and I just say, you know what, I'm just going to send them a LinkedIn invite anyway, and just say, explain who I am and, and why, you know, and I was like, I really thought your comment today about the futures is a very interesting question, Mark Buckley. Um, I'd really like to know more about your view. And I said that in the beginning before we got on the call. I was like, Mark, I want to be in a fireplace and just tell me about your childhood because, you know, we may have known each other, you know, somehow, I don't know, we may have known each other, or we were similar childhoods, did you play with dirt, did you, you know, watch Sesame Street, you know, and those kind of things, um, so you're looking for connection, and that's, that's the whole point of it, right, so passion, and connection, and then patience, right, give, you, patience is a very difficult uh, thing for a lot of people, especially young innovators, right, um, you, you, you feel like time is readily available to you and you need to grasp it and, and all this, which is true, right? But there's also with experience and that's a, a nicer way of saying age, you see that you know, there are patterns sometimes and you, there's moments where it's just, everything just falls into place and you just go, right? And that's what you're trying to learn when I say about patients, just trying to find those moments that kind of just go, 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 go. And then, it becomes pretty easy. I mean, a lot of people like Oprah and whatnot have talked about it, but that's that's what I wanna say to the people out there who are starting their careers, who are starting in school and, and, and wanting to be in space and all this other stuff. It, it's just like, continue to do that, but also how can you affect the people around you? Because that's a very important component as well, right? So um, in a positive way, right? So let me be clear, <laughs> in a positive way. And then you see and let the cards lie and see what happens. That's beautiful. Yeah, and that's so true. I have a friend, John P. Strelicki. He uh, wrote a bunch of great books, uh, The Big Five for Life and The Y Cafe. And he uh, says, says it very similar to you. He says, you know, if uh, you you know your purpose, you know what you want to do, There's you're, you're saying, I want to be like, like Cindy, or want to do something similar in that direction, then the most important thing is to find the who, to find those who have done it, who are already in that position, who are already thinking in that direction. Reach out, contact them, read their books. Uh, uh, if you can't get in touch with them personally, go out there and find out how you can um, kind of put yourself in their shoes by reading their books, listening to their talks, watching their videos so that you can get it straight from them, how they made that journey. Most uh, people that I know, even to Elon Musk, yeah, very open about telling you how they made that journey and how they uh, have done that craziness. And that, that's what I hear out of, of what you just departed. Um, and, and the bill thing, I heard Joseph Campbell, so my hearing's getting bad, but I wouldn't have known Bill Campbell because uh, I've uh, honestly, I've never heard of them. I don't watch oh. sports. I'm a bad per I'm not oh. the best. Then know. Mark, I have homework for you. You okay. need to read Billy, uh, billion dollar coach. That's his book. Okay. It's about his life. And it was written. I believe Eric Schmidt was one of the writers and, and somebody else. I forget. I, I apologize for the, the second one, but, um, read billion dollar coach. It's about okay. his life. And, and he impacted a ton of people in Silicon Valley. These are the people who built the technology futures that we're living in presently now. And okay. even Steve Jobs, he affected. So, you know, he, it's a, he's an extraordinary person and 
a um, ton of people went to his funeral and, you know, it, it's re he's remarkable. At so, least, uh, yeah. unless I'm having, uh, getting Alzheimer's early, uh, uh, he wasn't you part not. of gen general magic or anything on any of those teams, right? Or uh, original IBM or anything. He was just a he was. Uh, oh, he no, was. No, he was. Yeah. I, then, I, I forget then, then which I'm, it was. Then, yeah. Then I might have, might have heard, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I'm getting early Alzheimer's. Sorry. You're not. Okay, you're really that's Alzheimer's. a positive thing. <laughs> no, but you, if you did, if you did, if you thought that he was that into it, and here's the thing: like you knew that he was at some sort of big tech company somehow, right? And and yeah. whatnot. So you you've heard of him, you just don't recall the context, and that's not Alzheimer's. It's just a matter okay. of context. So. <laughs> Thank you. You're so kind. Uh, and and the last question uh, um, I have for you is really, what have you experienced or learned in, in your journey, your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh, there's so many. And I, I do. I write letters to myself sometimes, right? And, and read them later. Um, it's it just first and foremost, I think, is to be kind to yourself. Right, that kindness is is a rare, rare thing right now, especially during uh, times when people don't have the, their basic needs and, and whatnot. Is um, that goes a really long way, you know? If you're not being heard, if you're not part of a majority, if you're not um, that having that level of respect to be kind somebody uh, to somebody is is really really important. And and I wish that I could have said that to myself when I was younger, because, you know, you, you have a drive, you have some things to accomplish, you feel like you need to go to a certain school, or you need to have this. Um, it, it's, it doesn't matter. It, I'm still in the same room as CEOs. I'm still in the same room as presidents of the United States. I'm still in the, talking on the screen with the amazing Mark Buckley. You know, it, it, it really doesn't matter. You, you're kind. seeing my head swell already. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, the Trinity Library is a is a really big library, so you've got lots of room to grow. I got there, lots so. of room to grow. <laughs> well, that, yeah. that's all I have for you today, Cindy. Unless there's something that you didn't get to say or you'd like to say before we say goodbye, that was that's all I have. I, I do. Um, I do want to share one last thing, and I had thought about this last night when I was thinking about what we would talk about today is one of my favorite pieces of work of art that I saw recently was Thomas Cole's um, Course of Empire, right? It's a series of five extraordinary large paintings. It's sort of like Turner-esque kind of landscapes, you know, which is not usually a genre that I, I gravitate towards, but I was incredibly drawn to this. I saw it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a couple of years ago with my mother, actually. And it's, it, and this applies to you, and this is why I chose this to, to speak about this, is that it talks about a, a very pastoral image is the first, and that's, um, you know, in its savage state. So it's just land, trees, nothing. Then you go into an Arcadian, you know, more, I guess that's more pastoral, where there's a farm there, right? And, and there's a, a landscape of that. Then you get into, um, consummation of the empire and when cities are starting to be developed and whatnot and there's like a lot of abundance and you think of like Rome in its heyday it was like a lot of things people had a lot of things and there was a lot of consumption right then it goes into kind of a destruction period where there is strife it's talking about the evolution of civilization right there's strife and then the last one is decay and destruction, where the cities have uh, tumbled. You know, it's the columns are no longer there. That was in the heyday where people were partying and all this other stuff. Now it's just that, and you know what takes over? Nature. It's now covered with the plants and stuff in nature. And that's just the cycle of life and how our planet works and how, you know, nature will win in that. And I thought the equalizer to humanity would have been cancer, but I was wrong. It was actually a little virus, right? Um, that has been an extraordinary equalizer um, to societies around the world. And so uh, I leave you with that to think about and for us to uh, grab a drink and uh, or sit by that fireplace and talk about because 
I really want to talk about those painting with, these paintings with you. So I would I would love nothing more. We're going to have to do that very soon. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll be at uh, Hatch, uh, like you said, in September. I'll have to in Montana. Up, yeah. yeah, Montana. I love Montana. Big Sky, Montana. Yeah. And call up uh, yeah. Yarrow and make sure I get that invitation. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, because that's real close to my family too. So I'll, I'll visit my. I'm a, a four time grandpa. So uh, uh, all my kids are growing up and just became a fourth grandpa. My, so I got a new grandpa. You're too young. Oh Soraya, my gosh. Soraya is her name. And she's now, I think, four months old. So, uh, oh. boy, yeah, I need to go squeeze those. But that would be great to see you and have those discussions. It, it is. There is this big cycle of life. And so I, I truly love how you you wrap that up because it's uh, it's so vital and and we'll put the link to that maybe we can find something online where somebody can absolutely do, absolutely can look, I, it, it's those. traveling it's going around and doing the tours but i'll absolutely send you the link so that you have that uh, and can see exactly what i'm talking about they're extraordinary so and it, they're like the size of a wall they're massive we're 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 going, we're going to build back uh, uh, something different and and better, and it's this great reset that's in harmony with uh, with our biome, with our symbiotic earth and, and, and nature, so that we can really have that. We've seen many collapses before. It's there's been more than twenty civilization framework collapses on our planet, and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, very educated, very civilized, very. Uh, super infrastructures and they're not here anymore mm -hmm. but we're gonna beat that cycle and and uh and really create better worlds i i really thank you so much cindy it's been a sheer pleasure have a wonderful day and we'll see each other on the ch uh and for sure a hat uh i'll, I'll call up yarrow thanks so much mark it's thanks. great to spend this time with you thank you take care Tell Bye. everybody hi. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.